And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post podcast on a Friday morning. It's beautiful on the East Coast. The NBA regular season is churning to a close. Bobby Marks is here to talk all NBA with us. And Bobby, I think it's fitting that on kind of a blah night, Thursday night is usually such a great night for NBA games. Not so much last night. The marquee game was Celtics, Suns, a dispiriting blowout for Phoenix, uh, who has all their big three back and kind of needs to get their asses in gear because they're seventh right now. And I keep saying this. I know they've kind of fallen off the national radar because everyone's like, well, we just got to wait and see. Wait and see what the team looks like with the big three healthy. Like, that's cool. This team has as much at stake in this single particular season as pretty much any team in the NBA. They traded everything to build this team. They tore down a finals team, which is fine, whatever. That was their decision to build this team. They torched the second apron. They have nothing left to trade. And they're seventh. And last night, seventh, play-in, seventh. Kevin Durant's 35 years old. This is like kind of a crisis that no one is really talking about as a crisis. Um, And last night, they just kind of looked a little outclassed and outsized on the road against Boston. I know they beat Denver last week or a couple weeks ago. That was a great win without Booker for the Suns. They just don't have a lot of great wins. And and also, Bobby, to, to sort of lead into all NBA, um, kind of an interesting battle between two of the guys for we're all NBA and I don't have a ballot this year. And boy, this is like wild to have no positions. You can just do whatever you want, put players wherever you want. I know Bill Simmons has sort of rejected that he's going to do it the old fashioned way, which is cool. Voters do whatever they want. It's so it's wild. But the all NBA debate, I assume for people really starts with the last first team spot. I don't know if that's the case for you, but I think Jokic, Giannis, SGA, Luka as one to four in whatever order in the MVP race are just sharpied, lock them in, first team all NBA. And that leaves one spot. And I have four guys as candidates for that one spot, which means really I have eight of my 15 all NBA spots already done in some order. I suspect we have the same four. Maybe not. Do you have four guys for that spot? Of my, of my four, two of I them do. faced off last night. Yeah, I do. I mean, I have, you know, certainly the four that you mentioned here. And then, um, you know, I have Jason Tatum as five right now. Okay. I mean, I think you can make it. Can you make an argument? His teammate could push him a little bit here because Jalen Brown has been, he's been as good in the last 15, 20 games as, as any, uh, any player right now. He's making the second team all NBA and third team all NBA debate much more complicated. And he actually, you know, as we digest this positionless reality, he's probably a little disadvantaged by the disappearance of the forward spots um, because forward is just for whatever reason, always yeah. the thinnest group and guard is always the biggest group. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is the best this is the best Jalen Brown's ever played, I think. I mean, you can go back to the finals in 2022. He played great in high-stakes games, outplayed Tatum. It's, the last two months, there's been just like a new level of focus, calm, calculated decision-making where he's not overdoing anything in the half court, and he's overdoing, in a good way, everything in transition. He's finishing lefty more. Reggie Miller noted it on the broadcast last night. He's been sensational, but yeah. So Tatum is one of my four candidates for the last spot. Did you who who else are you considering there? Well, I mean, listen, I have a whole like menu. I have like a like a like a, you know like the coaches like I'm gonna pull this up for you, like the coaches menu when he's on the sideline. That that's my my all NBA menu, and and like you, I do not have a vote in this. Right, that so looks not... like the menu when I go to the restaurant, and I'm like, I can't <laughs> like I'm too hungry to read through all these options. And the first thing, the first like nice sounding pasta I see, I'm like, just that, I can't even look at the rest of this. Listen, I, I wanted to put Halliburton up there, but this is what I, this is what I've noticed when just going through here. And I know the injury since January 30th, I'm going to take my glasses off just to read this since that, since he, since he's come back on January 30th, this is the injury, right? 15.8 points per game. 30% 30% from three assists are down to nine, three shooting is still at a high level prior 23 points, 12.5 assists. I, I, I wanted to give him more love first team, but 
I think the injury has certainly hurt, right? Like that. And it, it felt like him coming back was just to, to get the game's criteria, right? Like just throwing him out there for 20, 25 minutes, hitting the mark, and then there. I think you have to make a case for um, certainly Kawhi. Um, you know, 52, six, 42 on threes, 24 points. Um, he's going to hit the criteria. Um, Durant, Durant's numbers, but here's one thing, <clears throat> just looking at it from our friends at cleaning the glass against top 10 defenses, um, 54% on twos, um, which is kind of on a, you know, somewhere in, in the, the middle area here. But man, 28 points, 53% from the field, 42% on threes. I mean, that's that is a um that is a high number. I mean, I want to see more with with uh, towns out with Anthony Edwards. Um, I think he's going to get one of these uh, you know, one of these three spots um here, 27% on threes. Um, but I got a list of like yeah, you know, certainly for the first team we talked about here, but I got a list of guys. I got like 15, 16 guys for basically like eight or nine spots. Yeah, I got, I got, it get, it's get, it gets tough second and third team. The last two spots for me on second team and then the whole third team is going to be interesting, particularly the last two spots on the second team. So basically like, here's who I'm down. Here's who, if I had a ballot, I would be down to for that fifth and last first team spot. Durant, Kawhi, Yep. Tatum and Anthony Davis. Those are the yeah. la- those are the last four guys for me. And if you look at the numbers, like Durant is twenty eight a game, six rebounds, five assists, fifty two percent overall, forty two percent on threes. I saw some people, you know, I didn't mention him in my all defense podcast with Kevin Pelton, and some people have mentioned him for that, and certainly. In a lot of Phoenix games, he feels like the the glue holding that defense together because of his combination of size and quickness. I, I haven't seen all defense level defense, like one of the 10 best defenders in the league, but it's he's not far from that. And again, 28, 6, 5 on 52, 53, 42, 57 from two. Tatum is 27, about the same. Eight rebounds. He has them there. Five assists, even there. 47% overall, 37.5% on threes, 55% on twos. So his shooting efficiency isn't the same. I've been and and Kawhi is gonna be Kawhi, it's it's an impossible to say. I might just default to Kawhi um because I know he's the best defensive player of these three guys. Um minutes wise, he's gonna be a little short of them, but not that not that short. But I'll tell you. Tatum seems to like this Durant matchup dating to the playoffs two years ago when the Celtics swept the Nets after the Nets had sort of had traded hard, traded Harden and the Ben Simmons drama was going on. Like, is he going to come back in the series? Is he not Tatum like badly outplayed Durant in that series to the point that I was like, is Durant like hurt or something? It was like a bad performance by Durant. He outplayed him again last night. I just think that dynamic is kind of interesting, but those are my top eight all NBA guys. Um, I don't know. Did you, you didn't mention Anthony Davis, did you? Or did I, I didn't did... No, I have him here. I mean, I mean, I could definitely put him in that, in that, that next tier, as far as if you're, you're, if you're fighting over that fifth spot on first team, all NBA, I think certainly second team, all NBA fifth in blocks. He's on pace to play the most games in, in, um, in a long, long, long time here. Um, and that's the concerning point, right? With the Lakers, both him and James, they're both on pace to play the most games. Um, together here and here here they are sitting in ninth so i did have this debate in my head anthony davis would definitely make first or second team at worst for me the numbers all say lebron should be an all nba player second or third team i mean the numbers are there the plus minus is there they're like massively better when lebron's on the court even their offense which has been which is still like 17th or 18th, despite a pretty hot last month. I think they're top five in the last month. Their offense is 17th, 18th, but with him on the floor, it's good. And it's dog poo poo with him off the floor. Defensively, I know he's not the same guy, but the numbers in terms of shooting efficiency is one of his best shooting seasons ever from three. He's not as consistently like dynamic with the ball anymore, particularly on the pick and roll. He just sort of, 
you know, you saw him rev it up late in that Kings game the other night where he had a couple dunks right in a row and they were falling behind. Before that, it was just kind of like kind of dribbling around shooting jumpers and he's almost 40. Like, by the way, how about the Kings just sweeping the Lakers? I mean, I had bookmarked those two remaining games they had as this is the Lakers shot. I, I've been saying for three months, and you know this every day on NBA Today, we essentially have the same debate about like which of these two teams can make a longer playoff run. And every day I, I anointed myself director of reality because they called me director of grouchiness. And they liked it when I said director of reality. The production notes were like, that was funny. I'm like, guys, we keep saying this longer playoff run. They're ninth and 10th. One of them is not running anywhere. One of them is like the starting gun's going to go off and they're going to fall on their face and the race is going to be over in the loser's bracket of the play-in. And now they're both like a 70 to 80% bet, according to the projection systems, to be locked in that 9 and 10 seed with Steph Hurt. The Kings swept um, the Lakers. I don't like, though, the whole how we've boiled this down to Domas versus AD, like like Domas's record against AD is nine and or whatever is if they're just playing one-on-one. I don't really remember doing this for like a lot of matchups before and talking about or AD just can't anytime there's like a way to frame things negatively for AD. We find a way to do it. No, I mean, listen, I think we have to, and that's the ABC game. I think on, on Saturday night is Lakers Warriors. I think we have to condition ourselves that that's going to be the plan. <laughs> I mean, that's going to be the nine ten because eventually time is running out here. Like, like and they're D- fortunate. Doris. Doris on the broadcast last night when they were pre- priming that game was like, can you imagine if LeBron and Steph were playing in the plane? I'm like, yeah, I've been imagining it for four months. I can imagine it. They, first of all, it's already happened. Second of all, yes, I can imagine it. Yeah. I mean, um, I, it, it's funny, you know, Dave um, McMenamin wrote a great D'Angelo Russell article um, during the week. And then after the Kings game, like um, the, his comments were like, you know, they asked him about, cause Rui, Rui had it going in the, in the first half. And then, I think he only had a couple, you know, a couple touches and like two, two attempts. And, you know, they asked him about that in the post game and he's like, well, that's not, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. It's, that's not that I don't want to talk about it right now. So it's like, you know, it feel, it just feels like as great as AD and LeBron go, it's like, as, as Russell goes, this team goes here, right? Like, and it's, that's, it's an interesting way to phrase it just because a guy who's been on the, on the, the trade market basically feels like since they've acquired him here, but the re yeah, I mean, the reality is that I think we're going to get these two teams and they're fortunate that, you know, Utah has, you know, they can't kind of get out of their own way and they're, they're shifting towards that, you know, that youth movement, like we saw last year. And then Houston, you get the Sangoon injury. Ken Whitmore's out for three weeks here. You know, they'll, they'll play, you know, 500 ball down the stretch here and probably win, 37 games and go 37 and 45. But the, those two teams, I think um, are pretty entrenched as far as nine and 10, especially where, you know, we'll, we'll see what Phoenix Phoenix is interesting. Brutal 15, schedule 15 and 10 with big, with the big three. Not great by the way. Like that's no. not they're They're plus, they're now plus 8.7 per hundred possessions with those guys on the floor, which is good, but you want, no matter what duo or trio you look at, if you're a title contender, you want that number to be like 12 or 11. And it was up there, and then they got smashed last night. 15 and 10, man, that's not it's not great. Second hardest schedule. Remaining. Remaining, yeah. A lot of road second, games. Yep, second hardest schedule. And listen, like last night, good first half. You know, they're in it, right? Two-point game, and then boom. You know, I mean, 25 for 50 from the field for uh, from three for Boston. Um, you got nothing out of Royce O'Neal. I'm watching the game and I don't want to be mean against some players, but some guy like, you know, Bo Bo, David Roddy, you know, like if that's what you know, your, your role players coming off your bench, but at the end of the day, your main guy's got to pop, you know, Booker Durant two for nine from three. Right. Like, you know. They got okay. outplayed. They got yeah. smashed by Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. And yeah. I mean, smashed like I love when the, Celt- the Celtics last night had the right blend. And I know I harp on this and I'm sorry of, yeah, you're going to shoot a lot of threes. You're amazing at it. You should shoot a lot of threes. They had the right blend of that. And Tatum and Brown combined had like eight just muscly drives to the rim where they just went through people. Like they went through Booker on one. They knocked Royce O'Neal sideways like four mm-hmm. times. I love when those guys play with that kind of power and they went at the Suns last night. Like you guys are too small for us. We're not, we're not, you're not standing in our way. 
Well, I mean, they're they're the, the the one of those few teams where you could be watching and it could be a six point game and you can go put the garbage out and you come back and it's a twenty point game. You're like, what just happened, <laughs> right? Like, and that happened. Like, I think um, I think uh, Phoenix had cut it to maybe eleven or twelve, and you just never felt like they were coming back. Um, and then and then Joe put basically all the guys back in, right? Like, all right, finish it off, right? And then all of a sudden that gets back up to um, back up to twenty. And like, I like what I mean. You got to. Horford was terrific last night with no Porzingis. I like what you get from Sam Hauser off the bench who can kind of, you know, make, made about three threes last night. And then you're not expecting much, you know, except for them to play their role with Holiday and, and Derek White, right? Like when your two horses are going like that, then basically White, either from a defensive standpoint, the ability to make a, a corner three, Holiday to control the offense here. But when you look at, you know, where this Eastern Conference is, like, I didn't like what I saw. I watched Philly, uh, Milwaukee last night um, while the other game was going on. I wasn't, you know, they're just kind of fighting through it, you, right? It's problematic to you that the Bucks yeah. had to squeak out a win over the Sixers who can't beat anybody without Embiid? Yeah, um, I mean, it, yeah. After then, getting that... absolutely mauled by the Warriors on the road and then the Kings on the road and losing to the Lakers without LeBron at the buzzer. Like, every time, I keep waiting for the Bucks. like, they had a nice run. The Minnesota and Clipper yeah. wins were real wins. So one of them came without be honest. The Clippers win. Those are like big statement wins. The rest of their Doc wins, Doc era wins, are like not great wins. Like a lot of bad teams. And yeah, their defense has been better. That's great. And I know Middleton, we're still waiting. And that changes everything about their team. Everything. But like they just haven't put together like I don't even think it's been a, like a five or six game stretch where like okay now the Bucks have it figured out and every time you think they're inching toward that this last ten days for the Bucks disturbing might be too strong a word but I'm like God the playoffs are like about to be here I know the East stinks yeah. from two to eight but it doesn't stink as much with Ann and Obi healthy and like came right back roaring the Knicks to life the Cavs are gonna get healthy and uh, Mitchell is back. Um, and the Sixers will see on Embiid, but like you kind of like, can we get it going? And and by the way, I might as well say it now. Maybe it's obvious, but like Dame is not making an All NBA team. No. I don't. I don't think. And and everyone's yeah. like, oh, Dame's getting going. Dame's finding his rhythm. Dame. I, I wrote this today in Milwaukee's last sixteen games. In his last sixteen games, because he missed a couple, he has eighteen or fewer points in seven of those sixteen games. He had eighteen or fewer points three times all of last season. And I understand it's apples to oranges because he's sharing shots now with the guy who's better than him and takes a ton of shots. He just hasn't been good enough. And that's, we could talk about Middleton. They need that. They need their depth to be a little better. Pat Bev has helped. They are not beating Boston and maybe not even getting to Boston. If Damian Lillard is giving you 18 points or fewer in every other game, which has been the case for the last 16 games. They're just, it's not going to happen. They need 25 every night against the Celtics. I mean, listen, I, on the list of 18 players I have on this sheet, I don't have him on here. I mean, that's, 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 that's the reality. I mean, and I he's been great in the clutch. He won the yeah, bunch of early he, season he, games. Listen, he's been he, very he, good. He just hasn't been good enough. He had a big shot down, the, down the stretch. Um, when the game was tight baseline jumper, uh, Thursday night here. Yes, he's been really good down the stretch. But um, the one thing that bothers me, and as you said, the, the East is the East, and and basically they'll be at in two, uh, probably two or three, unless New York really catches fire here, and maybe they will. Um, is that man when they let go of the rope, they let go of the rope. I mean, there were some games at West. You know, I mean that you know the Sacramento game. Like, I mean, when they get blown out, they get blown out. Like, like you look up, they're down twenty five, thirty points. Uh. Can we just go? You, you you jogged my brain on the Suns Celtics um, game. A couple of notes I wanted to make. You said the words Drew Holiday. He's becoming a really interesting, an even more interesting sort of flex point in a lot of these games. You saw at the beginning of the second half, the Suns put Nurkic on him to say, and we saw the, the Nuggets have done this with Jokic in both the Denver Boston games. And the point is obvious. It's we're going to switch your screens with your shooting big man, whether it's Al last night or Zingas in other games. And we're going to put our center on Drew Holiday. And if you want to rope our center into the action, you're going to have to use the guy that we have concluded is the least dangerous offensive player on your starting five, which is crazy that Drew Holiday might actually be 
that player, that the Celtics are that good. And right away, uh, on the first possession of the second half, Al Horford got an offensive rebound because if you're guarding Holiday with Nurkic, you're guarding Horford with the small. And he kicked it out to Jalen Brown for a three. About a minute or three minutes later, they were like, how about we just run a Tatum Holiday pick and roll? Like, well, we'll you're going to put Nurkic on Holiday? Cool. We think we can make plays out of that. They do that. Swing, swing. Derek White gets an open three as they're in rotation. We saw Holiday torched Nurk, uh, Jokic down the stretch of that Denver game when Boston yeah. almost came back. It's interesting. And then on the other end, Joe Mazzulla is like, oh, you're getting funky? How about we put Drew Holiday on Yusuf Nurkic? How do you like that? And then figure that one out. And we're going to have him try to poke the ball away. And by the way, one of the reasons Boston does that is when they get a stop, all your matchups are messed up going the other way. Boston is just playing chess in a lot of these games. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to a holiday real quick. He's got his date coming up. April 1st is his. Oh, that's right. Date, um, where he can extend here. Um, you know what? You know, listen, ownership has committed paying a lot of money to this group. Um, he's got a, a big number. Um, how does that play into it here? You know, take less, extend for more. Um it's going to be uh, it's 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 going to be interesting because the role of Holiday is different than a little bit different than it was certainly in, in Milwaukee and um, and you know thirty eight thirty nine million dollars. Um, it's hard for me to see. You know, I don't think Boston will pay max money for your you know as you said you're probably your your fifth best player offensively, but who has a tremendous role here. But that's going to be an interesting interesting negotiation or maybe it's ha happened already because you don't I mean listen you don't trade for him with the belief you're just going to have him as a rental right but they, that date's they, coming up you know april 1st so circle that there i forgot about that thank you for reminding me and they traded a lot for him well the um, other guy too and woe said this on um we're speaking of phoenix um the phoenix boston series and who was i think it was eight for nine last night is grayson allen Grayson Allen's got his date coming up, which is March 27th, where he can extend for four for 75, um, 16, 16 and change. I mean, if, if you're Phoenix, like you don't have many options here, right? Like going into free agency, like you're basically like you got to pay these guys or you're just going to go play the minimum game. Well, and for Phoenix, they're going to be a second apron team. And if there were a third and a fourth apron, they'd be one of those teams. <laughs> um, but you know, and obviously, you know better than I do the rules about how hard it's going to be for them to make trades. It's going to be basically dollar for dollar. But any mid-sized contract like that becomes a way for them to at least put yeah. some trades in the ballpark of maybe being possible. Um, and you mentioned Horford, by the way. I just, I, last night was a fun game for a number of reasons. But Al is like this beloved veteran all over the league, the ultimate pros pro um, he just has a couple of little goofy quirks to him that I like when they come out because people think of him as like boring old Al Horford. The first, remember when he used to flinch at missed free throws like really dramatically all the time? He hasn't like <laughs> like duck for cover. He has he hasn't done that lately. But last night, uh, after somebody hit a three in the second half, or maybe it was a first, I don't know. At some point in the game, uh, he someone else hit a three for Boston, and. He was jogging back on defense, and Phoenix called a timeout. And he did the thing I like when players do: he turned to the turned right to the sun sideline and made the timeout motion in their face, like you all need a timeout. I'm like, Al, you're getting you're getting feisty. All right, back to All NBA. Um, back to All NBA. I brought up LeBron and the Lakers, and somehow we ended up here because I I thought to myself, th again, the numbers say he should be second or third team All NBA. AD is going to be one of my first eight guys, whether it's first or second team. Are we really giving two spots of, of these 15 to the Lakers? Like, I think that's a fair question to ask. Um, so I will ask it this way. Do you agree with me that these eight guys, Jokic, Giannis, SGA, Luka, Durant, Kawhi, Tatum, AD, whether they're your first eight or not, will yeah. be on your All-NBA team? Yes. Okay. Yes. So that leaves us seven spots. We're already down to seven, and I've got like 20 guys yeah. that are I would characterize as like you could make a reasonable – argument for all of these guys 2021 20, guys by the way including victor Wembanyama, who well, I don't... There's, that's the thing and i said that to you when we were texting like and i mean uh kevin have we do the rookie rankings every month and that's coming out on monday here and i'm, and I'm writing victor's piece and then our andrew lopez had a great article up on uh, i think uh, thursday about it and i'm like should we be talking about like victor or, like all nba here as far as what he's been doing and then but then 
And then I, but then I start writing down all these names and I'm like, where the hell, who am I taking off? You know, like that's, that's the hard part. So, and I think, and I didn't listen to the podcast yet. And now I'm always suspicious that everything is fake and AI, but I I saw clips of Draymond Green on his podcast saying he thinks Victor Wembanyama is now one of the 20 best players in the NBA, which gets you in the ballpark of sure. all NBA. Here's my thing. And I've, I've had this debate about other all NBA candidates before. I do think team record matters, even if the team record being so bad for the Spurs is like the opposite of Victor Wembanyama's fault. He's the only reason in some of these games, him and, him and Demon Vassell, that they're like in the game. But I do think there's something to the notion of if I'm comparing a couple of guys who are statistically similar, and e- even with Wembanyama's statistical surge his his offense you know it come and go is too strong but he has he has inefficient shooting games more so than a lot of these other candidates do his games just don't matter like he's not playing in games that matter and other guys are and for me that's a tiebreaker but he's on my long list so my question is of all these guys on your long list medium list yeah below those eight who do you feel like give me two or three guys that you feel like most strongly about like they've just kind of got to, I've got to put them on, even if it's at the expense of some other guys. These are the guys that I just got to have on second and third team. Yeah. Now, 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 now this is getting, this gets tough, right? Um, I think Hal Burton gets on. I, I, I would put him on, and I'm not saying either second or third, one of the two. I, I just think what he's done, and I know I talked about post the, the injury post, um, you know, basically his assist, his turnover numbers have come up a little bit here, but leading the league in assists, um, you know, was probably one of the better players prior to that injury. And I know we got to take the whole body of work into, into account here. Um, but for me, I would put, um, because I don't think he's, I don't think he's hundred percent. So he's he, he hasn't been the same guy. And no. particularly as a scorer, teams have taken him out of games, but he's on, He's so to answer my own question, he's one of my three or four guys where I'm like, he achieved a level of specialness yeah. that is really hard to reach in the NBA and kind of feels like he's earned that spot. But this is why this is such a yucky process because he has, he's one of a few guys with an enormous amount of money at stake. Um, well, him, it, you know, and, and, and I mentioned him when we were talking about, um, you know, f- first team guys and I wouldn't, uh, you know, I wouldn't put him at first team, but no, I think he's not certainly, there. I mean, and, 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 uh, but the other one would be Anthony Edwards, certainly, you know, I think as far as who's got a lot of money at stake an extra 40 million, $41 million here, who's, um, you know, listen, 27 points, but it's tw- 27% on threes, um, you know, that the, the no, he's, he's 30, 37 percent on three. Oh, 37. 27, um, um, oh, I'm sorry. That's 27 percent. I think in the last 10 games, um, but no Carl Anthony towns here. Um, I would put, I would feel strongly about, you know, defending him for one of the final all NBA spots there. Yeah. So I have, I, my first stab at, and again, I, to be clear, I haven't done the deep, deep dive where I have my little spreadsheet up with all the fancy numbers, but I have, I, there's a deeper dive. I have to do looking at lineup data, clutch data, yeah. other trend lines and stuff like that. But I took a first stab at like, okay, here's my first stab at the last seven spots. Halliburton was in it. Ant was in it. And I just think Minnesota is going to get a guy yeah. and he's like the last man standing. I, I can't really get there with Gobert. Um, uh, as a third team guy, I just don't think he's dynamic enough offensively. He's been great. He's on my long list of guys. I just can't get there with him. So I think Ant will be on it. And the other guy, I feel like it's just, it's getting undeniable at this point. He scored 40 or something again last night yeah. is Jalen Brunson. Yeah. I think Jalen Brunson is going to make an all NBA team. He's played in a ton of minutes. He's had to carry this team without so many guys and they slumped. They didn't slump maybe quite as badly as Philly, which I think is going to hurt Tyrese Maxey a little bit. But he he's just an Iron Man. He he defends as hard as possible for his size. He's super efficient. He shot threes really well. I I just think it's it's the he's his numbers merit it, and it's just going to be hard to. I mean, I'm going to bring up his numbers. Well, now. here's it's, here's something to he's at 27 a game, yep. six and a half assists, 48 percent, 40 percent on threes. 
six and a half free throws a game, which is a career high for him. I just don't see how he doesn't make an all NBA team. Maybe, maybe I'm, it, it, it gets tight for everybody. And again, I don't have a vote. And like when we talk about guys who are going to get snubbed from our tentative, yeah. very, very, very tentative list, you're going to be like, wow, that guy's not on it. But Brunson is hard to deny, man. Against uh, teams with a top 10 record overall in the league, 25 points, 47% from the field, 38% on threes. That's against the top ten best teams in the league this year. I mean, that's that's a that's a that's a pretty good track record. And listen, all these guys' numbers have come down post All Star break. And I think you know he's certainly battling through a bunch of thing, things like everyone else here. But man, his overall body of work. Uh, it, and you're right. I mean, 40, 40 plus against Portland. Um, you know, a Thursday night and it's basically has, is willing this team, you know, you get OG back and, you know, um, and he looked like he tweaked his elbow a little bit last night. It was a little um, scary. Yeah. And, um, but then he came back in the game. For yeah. People who haven't and he seen said the game. that he came back in the game and he said, he's said he's sore, but fine. Um, but he, but Brunson has basically willed, um, willed this. Thing. And now like here, like this is the benefit of the positionless voters, right? Like we don't have to worry about, Oh, we got to find, you know, we only have six guard spots and we've got to figure out, you know, who's going to be left out. Um, you know, there's, as you said, like there's the benefits and then there's kind of the downside, you know, the downside is that the center position probably is going to be impacted, right? Like you could have made a case for, um, you know, certainly outside of Jokic, but with, um, you know, certainly AD and Sabonis and Bam and Rudy. And there's a, there's a Victor, there's a, you know, there's a group of guys there that, um, that are not going to be on, on this list here. Um, you said something about Brunson that jogged my memory. And now I don't remember what I was going to say. Um, just an unbelievable season for him. And they looked like a completely different team with Ann and Obi. Oh, I remember what it was. I, I did get a snarky text from a front office person on another team asking, what is the media reaction going to be when Tom Thibodeau gives Bogey and Burks DNP CDs in the playoffs? And I'm like, are we really going to get there? I mean, Burks basically is almost there, and Bogey is not playing. It's like a very no. strange dynamic, and it's, it's not like they're overloaded with guys. Like, Randall's still out. Break. It's going to be like break glass in case of emergency, feels like. Um, especially for, especially for Burks. I mean, you're going to, you know, now it's, you know, I, I, I did some, a, a podcast with our old friend, um, Ian Begley and, you know, the hot name is like, you know, Hey, can they afford to bring precious at you back? <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> precious has been playing with a whole new bounce in his step in New York. It's like he and Tibbs somehow see eye to eye He's off the dribble game. And he's got some dunks where I'm like, Oh my God, yeah. precious at just uncorked that thing. Yeah. I mean, the, um, the, the trade to get, um Boyan and, and Burks was like kind of like an it was like a emergency needed based on where our roster was at the time with all these injuries. And now when the when if you know with OG back and if, if Randall comes back and um you know certainly how Hart has played and DiVincenzo. Hart go ahead. No, I mean it's like it the the, the both guys I mean I think I think you'll see Boyan but I think you'll see him and if you're in, in the playoffs you might see him for 15 minutes. There's, he's not going to be out there for, you know, 20 plus minutes though. I think the role for him is certainly going to be different, but you know, if you want to advance deep into playoffs and I think the Knicks when they're healthy and we'll see if Randall comes back, they do need Randall as much as Randall has been horrible in the playoffs. And you know, Knicks fans have a love, hate relationship with him. Um, just the raw shot creation they need. If they advance deep into playoffs, to, to get to the conference finals, you need games from everyone. So if they get to the conference finals, which I think they can do, although they need to get out of Boston's half of the bracket, uh, which I don't know if they can. I mean, they can't really do that anymore functionally. Well, they so. got they got I pulled up their their schedule here. Um, they're, they're three games out. It's going to be they got two. Be... They got two more games against Brooklyn, three against Chicago, which is interesting. Um, 11th. Easiest schedule. I mean, they still got Boston, Denver, OKC, Milwaukee, sack twice, Miami. Yeah, yeah they're in a tough. Green. They're yeah. in a tough spot. I'd almost rather fall to six than be in four. And well, that's five. what we did. That's what we did in 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 Brooklyn in that infamous thirteen fourteen season. We fell to six because we wanted those young Raptors. 
And boy, oh boy, you, you get know to what? Though, no, and... that's over. That's overthinking it. In the, yeah, that, that's overthinking it because yeah. I, I want home court in the first round. I Cleveland is good, and I know the Knicks are not uh, obviously are not afraid of Cleveland after they just rolled them out of the playoffs and bullied them all over the floor last year. But they're good. And if I'm the Knicks, I'm like, if I got to face the Celtics in the second round, who cares? My point was, like, if you're going to do real stuff in the playoffs, you're going to need a bogey game. You're going to need multiple bogey games. He's too good for a break glass in case of emergency. In their defense, they did not trade much, and Grimes has been horrible in Detroit, just can't make a shot. Um, okay, so Brunson, how, I'm, I'm just going to read you my first stab at seven. And this was, like, literally I just wrote down names. I wrote, yeah. I did not did do much more than that initial research writing down names. For the last seven spots. Bruns, so to be clear, top eight, Yoka, Giannis, SGA, Luca, Durant, Kawhi, Tatum, AD. On. Next seven, no order in particular. Haven't done second versus third team yet. Just yep. next seven. Brunson, Halliburton, Ant, already mentioned. Devin Booker. LeBron James. Now it gets a little dicey. Here were the initial names I wrote down. Demonis Sabonis. Yeah. And I'll well, and then the last one was Paul George, who is yeah. is going to be my candidate du jour because um he's just never that st- not never, but he's not that statistically prolific compared to some of these other guys. You know, his PER is like 18.5, which is not very high. Um, but he's just a brilliant two-way basketball player. Yep. Now, I'm not saying those choices are final, and the two names that jump out among many that are not in that list of seven are Stephen Curry yep, and Jalen Brown, who we already mentioned, not to mention uh, De'Aaron Fox, Bam Adebayo, many others. And I'll I'll just start, you know, well, what did you think of that list? How is your how is your tentative list different from that? I would I mean, I would put Jalen Brown in there. I, I really would. I, I just think, you know, the second half of the season here, um, you it's know, so good. It has been like really good. Like really, I, I don't really disagree good. with you. He might he might get in over Paul George or Sabonis. He might benefit from Booker. Booker's Booker only has two games to play with as far as falling off the sixty five game criteria. I, also, a, a name that t- to me just falls short. Even though every time I seem to watch them play, he's sensational and scores thirty five points and makes one turnaround jump shot fading fading away after another in crunch time. Is Jamal Murray, who who's ineligible? Well, he, I think he can get there. He no, can, he can't get to sixty six. No, because he had two games of playing less than fifteen minutes. Okay, so, so he out. comes off. Yeah, he comes off the list there with um, because of that. No, you could have like um, you know, you could have made that case. You can make that case for him as far because yeah, you're right. I mean, you watch him like, and he had two shots. Oh, is the Toronto? The Toronto game, they came back. Like I'm like, oh my god! Yeah, they god. decided to try in the second <laughs> half. He, his shot making is just outrageous. I yeah. mean, outrageous. So he's out, and Donovan Mitchell is the one that like he definitely would have made an All NBA yeah. team, and he's yeah. going to come up short. You know, it's funny when when um when you go through and like you had thought like when all these guys falling off the board, MB, Jimmy Butler, uh, Donovan, all like oh like it's going to be you know there's going to be guys who will default into um into uh into the all nba conversation it's like no it's actually harder right like i i said last night and i love people's reaction because um demar derozan hit 65 games i mean it's remarkable what he's been able to do he how available he's been right i i think 93 percent of the games he's played in since coming into the league which is ridiculous and he's been really really good this year so i said he's been you know he hits the criteria he's all nba and now and then people comment like well is that what we're at right now we're just good players or all. I'm like, no, no, I didn't say I'm voting for or why I would vote for him. I'm just saying how reliable this guy has been. And he's been really, really good. You know, 23, four, um, 47 from the field and 33% from three. He's, he's been good. All NBA worthy. It's hard. Unless all of a it's sudden hard. we get some injuries and some of these guys we've mentioned are not, are not eligible there. So I just mentioned those seven guys that I had plus Steph and Jalen Brown, who were like the next guys. Not even mentioned yet, but on my list. And I think, I think to your point, I think DeMar's season has been roughly equivalent to some of these guys, roughly, maybe not quite as good, maybe a little better, depending on your taste. Both the Pelicans guys are going to fall short. Brandon Ingram and Zion, 
despite their surge. And of course, as soon as everyone starts talking about the Pelicans, they fall on their face. In, in a, in a, <laughs> as soon as we talk about Herb Jones the, redefining his three point shot, he goes yeah. like one for nine. <laughs> um, uh, Paolo Bancaro isn't going to get there. I don't think. Um, and, and Bam, look, I've been driving the Bam wagon for seven years. I love Bam. He's on my short list for all NBA. He was a no brainer all star for me. I I just don't think offensively he's been quite efficient enough to crack this. I, but it, but the irony is, and this is why Sabonis is such a tough case for me. And it could be over indexing on Kevon Looney just bullying him for every rebound in the playoffs last year. In my basketball soul, if I need to win one playoff game, I think I'd rather have Bam than Sabonis. Mm-hmm. In my basketball soul. If you ask me who the best player on the Sacramento Kings is when the yeah. competition gets really elite, I think it's probably still De'Aaron Fox, yeah. who's averaging 27 points a game this year, torches the Lakers every time he sees them. He's had a weirdly like inconsistent last couple of months where there are some games where I'm like, but did De'Aaron, like, where is De'Aaron Fox? And and Sabonis, for, for all the warts defensively and like, you know, all all that and the lack of a jump shot and the way he sort of pigeonholes you into playing a certain style on both ends of the floor and everything I just said about his playoff ceiling and Fox might be better and all that. The guy is just every single goddamn game, a million rebounds, a million assists. Now, some of them are little handoffs and, you know, whatever. It's not that hard, but like he's still a really good passer, 20 plus points. He works on defense. Like, I know he's got limitations, but he works. He's smart. He gets rebounds. Like, that's a part of being a good defense player is finishing possessions. As a regular season player, and this is a regular season award, I just think his consistency and his ferocity really stand out. But I I am not wedded to him being on any of these teams, particularly when you're like, there's no, like, Jalen Brown probably has got to be on it. The Celtics probably need two guys. If the Lakers are going to get two, the Celtics sure as hell need to get two. Yeah. Curry, I, I mean, it's Steph Curry. He's still shooting. You know, it doesn't feel like he's had a great year and he's only played 57 or 59 games and he's injured. 27 points, five assists, 41% on threes. His advanced stats are really good because he's Steph Curry. It's hard, man. Did you have Sabonis? I did. I mean, first in rebounds, fifth in assists. He has more (laughs) triple-doubles than Jokic. I know that's stupid, but I'm like, wait, he's more than Jokic? How is that even possible? It's so you and he's he's already hit the criteria also. I mean, I I mean, I think sometimes you do have to reward consistency, you know. I mean, it's um I'm I'm taking him over his teammate. Um, if I mean, I don't even have Fox. I have him on my list, but not. It's weird list. because you look, you look at his numbers and you're like, oh, he's still averaging 27 a game. It does not. It has not felt 27% like 27% since the break from three. Yeah, he's yeah. down to 36% from three. And that was a big part of his early season. But here's the thing. Like still. Sabonis is like a almost plus zero for the yes. season. Plus 31 total. Yep. And when he plays without Fox. They're minus five and a half per 100 possessions, according to cleaning the glass. Like Fox has been, I don't know. And like what I just said about Bam, I I really do believe if I had to win one playoff game, I do want Bam. Offensively, he's just not been as dynamic and as efficient as they need him to be. And that's not, I mean, he's just, they've been so bereft. I mean, so hurt by injuries all year long. But man, I love that Spo shouted him out the other night after that Denver-Miami game. What and this is why I would I, I just it's hard for me to leave Bam off all NBA. The work he did just making it hard for Jokic to catch the ball and the eagerness with which he was like, Oh, we're playing Jokic. I want all of it. I want every possession. Don't throw, I don't want zone. Don't try to save me with zone. I want a front. I want a three-quarter. I want to get around when the entry pass comes and bat at the ball. He wanted every bit of that matchup. And you can tell by what he says and how he plays that Jokic really respects him and respects the way he plays. And, like, they lost the game. Bam did not have a great offensive game. He has not had a great offensive season. Good, not great. Yeah. But you watch that game, and you're like, this dude, I mean, not to go all NBA Twitter on you, but, like, this guy is a dog. Like, Bam is someone I would go to battle with every single day. I just can't quite get there on all NBA. And, and like, but Sabonis' numbers are just, it's every night. 
Yeah, no, I mean, listen, Bam um, on the court, 111 points per 100. Off the court, 119. So, yeah, certainly the offense. But as you said, man. I think they have a negative, a slightly negative yeah, point differential with Bam on the floor. They do. Um, it's, it's, you know, he's had an all-NBA type season, but – you know, I don't even know if he's going to hit the criteria. I mean, that's the other thing. He's played 54 games. You know, he's basically going to have to, you know, play 11 out of the, and probably will. I mean, unless he's injured, 11 out of the next 16, 17 games here. Um, but I would, if you're asking me, you're right. I mean, I like how you put, you know, hey, I need to win a game. Who am I putting out there? But I do think, as I said, I'm going to reward consistency with Sabonis. You, you know, you mentioned all these guys like Booker among them. Um who who need to play who need you know i mean zion's missed 11 games so he hasn't hit it yet i don't think he's gonna i mean their their point differential is way better so than zion real quick on, real it's not, quick. It's, by the way it's not a knock on zion they're still plus two per 100 possessions with zion on the floor but they're plus eight without him i don't think that necessarily says anything it's just real real, real quick on um real quick on zion um because I, I i sent you guys some notes on him because it'll, it'll probably will be dis discussed you know he's on pace to play the most games since he's come into the league here he's got that funky contract here um, the games played this year does not impact his contract as far as guaranteeing the last, um, the three years after three years starting next year, um, or four years starting next year. The last three of the, those years are, um, you know, are, are non, um, are, you know, are non guaranteed here. Basically he has to hit those games played criteria in a 24, 25 season to trigger the last years here, but he's had a, He's been healthy. He's had a heck of a year. Um, you know, I mean, that's, it's all about availability, right? I mean, that was always the big thing about him. The, the hard, the, 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 the discouraging thing is, is that the game where he was basically on a national, as you, we've talked about the, the platform game, the Laker game in that playing, um, the in-season tournament was the stinker, right? And then all of a sudden that gets, you know, that's like the headline here, but he's been, he's been available and he's been really good. I said it earlier this week with Andrew Lopez. The last month, I think, has been the best defensive month of Zion's career, maybe by a lot. Maybe the best all-around month of his career, although the scoring hasn't been explosive every game. And then, of course, after beating up on a bunch of bad teams, which, by the way, you have to do, and they really beat him up. Like, they did what a great team would do against bad teams, which is just spank them right out of the gate and end the game in five minutes. Like, we don't even have time for you people. Hawks without Trey Young and Sadiq Bay. And by the way, what a horrible oh, ill timed man. injury for poor Sadiq Bay, who's entering free agency this year. Uh, restricted free agency didn't come to an extension. I hope he gets well, um, soon. They just didn't have time for the Hawks. They're like, we don't have time for this nonsense. Um, then they come out against Cleveland at home and just get rolled. And it's like, all right, well, they play the Clippers tonight. Like Clippers are on a back-to-back. -back. Kawhi's back, though. Harden missed last night's game. Kawhi's back. That's a great sign. You know, he walked out of that game yeah. at halftime with back spasms. And everyone's like, oh, my God, here we go again. And the, it's going to be we're, – we're going to get that feeling in our gut every time he leaves a game like that. And he came right back and lit up the Bulls last night. Paul George was 11 for 12 from the field. Um the more I talk through this with you, the more I do think I have the right nine guys for the last seven spots. And again, I have more digging to do, but Brunson, Halliburton, Booker, Edwards, Sabonis, LeBron, PG, Steph, Jalen Brown. It's just uh, Jalen Brown is going to make an all NBA team. I, I have to, I have to recalibrate. He, I, he's, he, he's just been sensational. You know, it's a, it's a shame. Um, and I think he would have had a chance, um, and I, you know, watching him last night against Milwaukee, who basically uh, trying to will. Oh, Maxi, thank yeah. you for bringing up Maxi. Trying I, to I, I can't believe I haven't mentioned him. He's on my list. Philly yeah. fans, don't be mad at me. Tyrese Maxi, <laughs> don't be mad at me. He's on. I mentioned him. These guys, Zion, Bi, all these guys. He's right. His name's right there. And he doesn't. He have money at stake here too. Yeah. Well, his is interesting because they didn't do the the extension because um they wanted to keep his cap hold. He's got a really low cap hold. They want to basically use cap space first and then circle back and resign him. If he if he earns all NBA, then he has the right to negotiate the Up language, 30%, the, the, right? the the thirty percent, or it have to be between both. So he's he would be locked in at that two hundred five number, and they can bump it up to two two four uh, two forty five two forty six. Um, 
they would have it's a little bit different than what Edwards and, and Halbert have it in their contract. But yeah, I mean, listen, if he makes all NBA, I would think that certainly would be on the table. Yeah, I again he's on he's on my list and I didn't watch that game last night. I'll probably watch the second half of it today. Um, because I'm interested to see why it was as close as it was. Um Tyrese Maxey, despite I mean, it's not just that Embiid's been hurt and he was in the concussion protocol, missed some games. Yeah. And that's that's a serious thing to come back from. It, they're just, I mean, like De'Anthony Melton, nobody talks about him nope. being out. It's a huge deal that he's out. I mean, they are a mash unit up and down the Batum's in and out of the lineup. He's still Tyrese Maxey at 26 points, six assists, 45% shooting, down to 49.5% on twos, which is a little low for this group, yeah. but still at 38% on threes. And man... It's not his fault, but there are games like, again, they're a mash unit. It's like, oh my God, Mo Bamba's playing 23 minutes a game and starting where it just feels like their only offense is like, hey man, can you just like, you're really fast and you can shoot threes. Can you like do something? Because I mean, look, I wrote about it today. This this Tobias Harris story in Philly is ending so badly. Yeah. Like for his scoring to go down without Embiid, Look, the whole just boiling a player's game down to points is is always facile, but I can boil it down to points for the for Tobias Harris in the last two months. Like he's just not scoring enough points, and he's not like it's, he's doing anything else that really really helps you. And I've like I have clips. I only included one in the column. There are others I have in the bank. That's like he doesn't even look like he wants the ball. Like I've seen him flash open in the paint, not put his hands up, not call for the ball, and sort of moonwalk out of the play touch hot potato it when he has like a, a pick and roll coming toward him or a favorable match. I'm like, is this guy, maybe it's just that he's heard all the noise about like, I can't wait till his contract expires. We're going to have so much cap space and you couldn't blame him for that, but it's, it's not, it's not going to end well in Philly. Yeah. I mean, last night <clears throat> in the Milwaukee game, you felt like there were times, especially when they needed baskets down a stretch um, where he, you didn't like, is he still, is he on the court? Is he part of the five? He made two big baskets down to cut it to three. And then he like he hit a he fell. I I thought he broke his ankle. <laughs> I mean, where he rolled his ankle, and I'm like, we're not going to see him anymore, right? And he came back. He stayed in the game down the stretch. So I give him credit there. But you're right. I mean, listen, if he's supposed to be your third best player here, like without now, your he's your second best player with no Embiid. Um, everything is kind of taking a taking a uh, taking a taking a dip here. The guy who's had the most fun without Embiid is Kelly Oubre. Kelly Oubre, Kelly Oubre Jr. is like, give me all the shots. Oh, you don't want to shoot? You don't want to give me all the shots. I'm ready for all the shots. And that's why it's so hard to project Philly because we sit here and they're in the play-in now. They're seventh. Oh, they have officially that, fallen into the play-in. Philly, Miami, play-in. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, and then there's a big gap between them and the Hawks, Bulls showdown. Oh, yeah. By the way, credit to the Bulls. I make fun of the Bulls a lot. Bulls they fans. Compete. Man, Bulls they, fans make yeah. They, Bulls they, fans make more fun of the Bulls than I do. Bulls media makes more fun of the Bulls than I do. Everybody makes fun of the Bulls. They're 17 and 14 in their last 31 games. Yeah. They play really hard. Vooch has been mostly bad this whole season, like yeah. offensively not efficient enough. Defensively, you know what he is. Their guards compete like hell. DeRosa competes like hell. Shout out to Kobe White, who got caught on a chase down block, a sensational play by Pascal Siakam the other night, fell hard. Landed awkwardly. I feared the worst. He's been one of the best like he, stories like, of the whole squad when he fell on him. His leg bent backwards. And he's like questionable and clean. The MRI came back clean, yeah. I think, according to Woj. And he was questionable last night. Hopefully they'll play soon. He's had a fantastic season. One of the leading most improved candidates. They play hard, man. And like if they're playing the Hawks in the 9-10 game, the Hawks are a mess injury-wise. Like the, yeah. the Bulls are going to – they should – anything can happen in one game. They'll be favorites in that game, and then it's like one game to get into the playoffs, and here come the Bulls. Yeah, it's going to be like last year, right? We could, we could get Bulls Heat playing just to get into the uh, into the eighth spot to get the uh, the Boston Celtics here. But I think Miami's – I think their schedule is really – I looked at it last night. They've got this third easiest schedule. Miami yeah, once they got they got through Denver the other night and now it's Angel Food. They got Detroit twice, Toronto twice. You know, they got a bunch of teams on there. So I think I think they Miami did just probably... lose to Washington. I know that was a bad one. That's a bad uh, one. They have a knack, Miami, 
it's like a running joke. Cooper Moorhead or, or always tweets about it during their games about uh, here another clutch game for the Heat. They did have a knack for like no matter who they play, it's like all right, it was three point game in the last two minutes. Uh, back to the on, on the Sixers. If Maxi makes All NBA, I wouldn't have I wouldn't really argue strenuously against it. He's not he wouldn't make my ballot at least not now. There's 15 games left in the season. None of this is final. Yeah, um, he's been unbelievable for them. But one of the reasons it's so hard to project them is it's not just Embiid, who obviously the whole team is different. Everyone's role is different. He snaps everything into place. But it's that everyone around the, the whole team is a mess. Like Tobias Harris is kind of falling apart. Melton's hurt. Um, other guys have been hurt. And it, it's it's just everything at once. And it's it's it. they need more than just Joel Embiid back at close to 100%. They need these other things to flip too. And it's coming a lot of, a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, listen, you, you went out and got buddy healed at the, um, at the deadline and he's been, you know, if you're expecting him to be your second best player on the court, I mean, that's a little bit of a, a little bit of a stretch here, but you, you've seen a lot of Nick Batum, um, you know, in, in these games here, you've seen KJ Martin now. Um, but you're right. It's like, you don't know what you're, you're, you know, it's, it's basically has been a mass unit, um with this uh with this group i feel bad for maxi in some of these games it's like okay well, I gotta, he, listen he last night when you watch it there were three plays he and like it's it, it's eventually like and i give him a lot of credit especially coming off a concussion like he went to the basket like he went like full force vengeance here and two he didn't get the call one he made a layup um i mean but man he, as i said like last night he was trying to will this team um in the fourth quarter uh, let's wrap it up. I didn't, I don't know if you had a final, if you had a ten, tentative final, tentative, tentative final list of guys that you put on. Was LeBron on it? He was, he was on it. Yep. I mean, I, it's, it's hard to leave him off. <laughs> I mean, it really is. It's, and I it, know it's two guys on the ninth place team in the Western conference. I get it. Like I, I, I get it. Look, it's going to be a really interesting couple of weeks, not only for the playoff races, you know, four to eight is a mess in the East. We mentioned the play in in the West, the battle for six in the West is a four team race right now, unless the Lakers or the Warriors get into it. That's an important battle. Um, really fascinating stretch run coming. And it all of this all NBA stuff we're doing is very preliminary. There's 15, yeah. 16, 18 games left for every team. And to your other point, like, you're going to have to kind of have two ballots going into the last day of the season to make sure some of these guys hit 65 games. Well, um, even so Luka. It's, it's like, it's, listen, like Luca didn't play last night. And I, and I don't think it's as serious as I say, but like, you're going to probably, if it's, you know, you're going to want to manage that now. I mean, I mean, as best as you can, I mean, they're in the seven, eight game right now with them. And I think them and Phoenix are in, uh, in that spot here, but Luca's seven games away from hitting 65 games. Like, I think he will, but that's something to, to keep an eye on. And there's another guy, like, you know, that, that he's got a lot riding on all NBA because he becomes super max eligible. And in, in, in the uh, two, two, he, he can only sign it in 2025. Shea hit it last night. Shea hit 65 games Thursday night. So he'll be, you know, he can, he'll be all NBA. He'll be super max eligible um, to sign next, next year here. But there's, yeah, there's like, it's not just the who's playing who in the standings, but. Um, as you said, with with all NBA, you got to almost have two, you know, you have to have two separate um, two separate ballots here because, you know, where guys are with games played. I'm going to do a Dallas segment next week, hopefully with I'll, I'll drag Tim McMahon on. Um, I just think they're a completely fascinating team that night in and night out, you never quite know how they're going to look, who's going to make shots, who's not going to make shots. Is Maxi Kleba going to play? At the five for extended periods of time, yeah. o only at the four, not very much at all. Dante Exum's in the picture. Josh Green got hurt last night. Hopefully he's all right. Uh, but given how uh, I I would I've heard that the Luca thing is is going to be okay soon ish. Yeah. I mean we'll see. You never know with the hamstring. Um, he'll hit sixty five. He'll make sure he hits sixty five if it's even an issue. Um, and then he's you know a, an MVP candidate. First team all NBA. All right, yeah. Bobby Marks, we got a lot of season left to go. Um, thank you for coming on. Um, because not only are you watching all these games, I can tell by how bleary eyed you are every morning we do this. Well, here, here, here's what happened yesterday. So I'm writing off season articles. 
Um, I've got one de- one done, um, 29 to go. Um, 10, the 10 lottery teams. I worked on um, the Brooklyn Nets yesterday. And after I was done, like there was a sense of like dehydration, sense of like dehydration slash I needed a nap after writing a thousand words on my former team in, in Brooklyn. Well, I hope you took, did you take a nap? I didn't. I'm a, I, I am good at very few things in life. Like, like maybe four things. Can't fix anything. Don't know anything about cars. Yard work, subpar. Um, I can take a 15 minute nap like nobody's business. I set the alarm. I close my eyes. I am asleep instantaneously. And I often wake up with 30 seconds to go before the alarm. I, if they, if this were somehow a competitive, maybe there probably is competitive. I mean, there was one day I turned on ESPN eight and there was pillow fighting on. So there probably is competitive napping. Um, Hey, if they maybe, wanted to do a competitive nap uh, competition, you know what you could do? You could go down to that Orlando Magic new practice facility there because they got, you know what they got there? Nap rooms. They got like four nap rooms. Look, you know, some of those airports, particularly international airport hubs, have like nap areas where you can get your little private booth and nap. And it's just like insanely expensive. There have been some layovers where I was like, I don't know. It's like $200 an hour. <laughs> Sounds like a stretch, but all right, Bobby Marks. Uh, thank you, sir. Read all Bobby's stuff, off-season guides. He's got the Kevin Pelton uh, rookie rankings coming out on Monday. I suspect Victor will be atop those yeah. uh, indispensable work. You know all the salary machinations and implications of all this all NBA stuff. So appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Bobby. You got. It. Thank you. Okay, the topic du jour in NBA media for the last couple of weeks, the last month really, has been the rather sudden decline. In scoring after a whole bunch of 150, 140 games, dude scoring 50, 60, even 70 points. Scoring since February 9th, which is notably before the All Star break, according to our ace, Kevin Pelton, who did all the, the digging. The trend started before All Star. Scoring is down three points per game, which is quite a lot from the period this season before that. Quite a lot considering offensive efficiency tends to trend up during the season. Free throws which were already low to begin with and keep getting smaller and smaller and lower and lower as time goes on and flow of the game improves, hit their lowest point in February, according to Kevin Pelton, lowest free throws per game, the third lowest in any month in the entire history of the NBA. And they're even lower in March. So that has resulted in a lot of talk of what's going on here and a lot of wondering if, at the league's annual, you know, get together at all-star. I did not attend all-star. Was there some sort of meeting of the powers that be? I know a lot of league team people have been um, belly aching behind the scenes about, Oh, it's too easy for offenses. We need to help the defense. This has been a subject that the competition committee, not just now as Joe Dumars, one of our guests has confirmed recently to Tim Bontemps, but it was brought up at the lottery last season and probably before that at previous competition committee meetings. So rather than speculate and wonder what happened, was there some memo sent out? Was there a conversation to be had? I said, why don't we bring on the actual proper people to talk about this? So we have from Olympic tower, New York city. I want to get your titles, right? Joe Dumars, executive vice president and head of basketball operations. And one of the villains of my childhood. Hello, Joe Dumars. Hello, Zach. How are you, man? That's a great introduction. I will not villains. I will not hold it against you, and you did not foul Kareem in the finals. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Zach. And the senior vice president, head of referee operations and training. I think I have that right. Monty McCutcheon, how are you? I'm doing fine. It's good to see you. It's good not to be one of the villains of your youth. And, you know, it, it'll be fun today. You're a little too young, I think, to be one of the villains of my youth. But now I'm going to go back and dig through the archives and see if there's some call that I can really hold against you, have to create some emotional grudge that Let's I can have. Let's agree that there is some call and save you the time of, of having to do that research. Well, and Joe at least has this going for him. He's not Lambier. So you can never be the, the level one villain of anybody's childhood. Okay. okay. So, so I just said the numbers. Um, You guys have heard all of the speculation. So I will just start off. Either of you can answer this question. What, if anything, is going on and what if anything is driving what's going on joe please 
So I, I, I would say this first and foremost, there was, I will emphatically say, not one, one day of a meeting of the minds that we needed to um, change what we were seeing with scoring. Like, absolutely not, Zach. Just, I, I mean, it's, it's just, I, I don't know. When you hear stuff like that and you're sitting in here or you walk into the office and you just kind of look around and you go, we haven't said a word to Monty and the, ref and the referees about changing anything. When the conversation has come up, Zach, I've said this in multiple, multiple meetings here. I don't think people, fans, media really care what the score is. It doesn't matter what the score is. People want to see great competition. I've said this in, in meetings internally several times. I saw one of the best games. I, I, I rode up to Boston a month or two ago, Denver at Boston. I think it was 100 to 99, 101 to 100. One of the best games of the year. And it had nothing to do with the score. It was just what was played. Or you can have 130 to 131. And from a league office standpoint, we just want to see incredible competition on both sides of the ball. Offensive plays, incredible defensive plays. That's all, Zach. But there's never been one second of hey, we need to do something and we need to tell the referees to change. Like that has absolutely never happened. So, so okay, so there doesn't have to be like a formal gathering in Indiana for some sort of trend shift to take place. There doesn't have to be a Zoom call with 100 referees or 50 referees to say this. There can just be, hey, Monty ran into GMX in the hallway and GMX said, oh, it's too easy for the offense, this and that. And that conversation times 50 with 50 different participants and 50 team-level executives and 50 referees and whatever just sort of trickles around and people start talking to each other and things sort of happen. Is is that a more accurate explanation? Or are you guys – are is, is what you are – or are you what you were actually saying is this is totally random. We don't have any explanation for this. I can jump in here, Zach. I think that there's a little predisposition to that question, at least not intentionally, I don't think. Or, or maybe, maybe, or maybe, or maybe that we're just sitting here waiting to be influenced. We have work to do every year as officials. You know, we, we are constantly evaluating officials, evaluating their work. You know, we have five developmental advisors, coaches, if you will, Joey Crawford, Mark Wunderlich, Bennett Salvatore. We're at a little over 22,000 interactions with our referees this year between those individuals that are coaching them, obviously me overseeing it. That's a lot of interactions. Our work is to drive consistency. And within any year, there are points in which we are not as consistent as we would like to be could be traveling one year. It could be flagrant fouls. It could be transition take fouls. It could be drives to the basket. And in that work, I most certainly, and my role is to most certainly coach up what our rule book says. One of the things that's been in the rule book for hundreds of years, and we've only been here 75, but it feels like hundreds of years, is that if a dribbler has a straight line path to the basket, they cannot be crowded off that straight line pathway. The same is true for a defensive player's pathway. Now, that's different than block charge. Block charge is about beating someone to the spot. But if you are both on parallel pathways, neither party is allowed to take someone off their pathway. And there most certainly has been some coaching this year and teaching this year about making sure we remain consistent from Monday night to Tuesday night to Wednesday night. And I do think that we had some work there that we had slipped in. And so we most certainly have been teaching what our rule book currently states is good basketball so that there is a balance for competition to Joe's point. Good competition isn't score-based. 
It is based in an equitable situation for both offensive and defensive players to reasonably expect to be able to compete so that neither party is placed at a disadvantage. We most certainly have done that coaching this year, as we have in other subject areas, by the way, that maybe haven't garnered the same amount of, of um, political or media attention. That is our work. Our work is to make sure that our rule book is upheld every year. And with 22,000 interactions with our staff, we're covering lots of subject matter in making sure that we drive consistent work. When we do see areas of need, we can't allow outside noise to influence us in either direction, meaning it's not general managers grabbing us in the hallway and sharing their case and making us change. Neither is it ignoring someone grabbing us in the hallway if there's merit to a point of view or a perspective. What I will say is that much before February, we in within our work were already recognizing a need for consistency in this area. We have absolutely worked on that consistency. I think we've done a better job at it. And I also think that it's important to say that it's easy for outside influences, media, fans, wherever it may be, even teams in some instances, to focus on one area as the thing. You know, uh, possessions are down right now, which accounts for about 40% of that drop of three points that you're talking about. And I think that it, there is an all-inclusiveness to an arc of a season. Teams start to reduce their rotations at this time of the year as they garner up for playoff pushes. There are lots of impacts to how teams start to focus differently. We've been doing our work. Players get better at adjusting to the work and they make proper adjustments. And we see what we see analytically in any given year. This year, it so happens to be this subject matter. So let me just ask the dumb, simple question. Has a shift in officiating contributed to the recent month-long decline in scoring and free throws? I don't think it's a shift in officiating. The officiating has always been owning up to the rule book. And so do I think that that there has been, I mean, the stats are the stats. There are less fouls being called. There's, there's. I'm not gonna sit here and argue what is factually true. What I will say though is there hasn't been a conscientious effort to shift towards le lesser fouls. That's not, there, there has been no such meeting. There's been so, no such dictum. What we do is look at plays, individual plays, and say from game to game, we can do better here. This was not a foul. This was a foul. We're, we're concentrating on what's not a foul in this conversation. Out of those thousands of conversations we've had with players, there's been plenty of them that says, we missed a foul right here. This needed to be called. And so there absolutely has been no, you know, outward attempt to lessen fouls. We do need to be good at our work. And the game itself informs what that work looks like. When Joe played, 90% of the game, 95% of the game was below the free throw line even for guards. I watched a game from 2008 recently. You know what the three pointers were like 16 to seven in the middle of the fourth quarter that each team had taken. The game has absolutely changed. And as a result, what's valued now are corner threes, free throws and layups. The mid range has, has been discussed ad nauseum has disappeared except for a few very efficient players at it. Right. And as such with the game spread out like that, you're going to get more drives to the basket because that is what is valued by the analytics is layups and drive and kick to the corner three or to the wing three. And when we see that analytically, refereeing is always going to be a half a step below the innovations of the game. If we're four steps behind it, we're really bad at our work. But players are going to always innovate the game. And as such, we have to catch up. Part of our good work is making sure plays according to the current rule book are being adjudicated properly. Do you think that is more the case today than it was six weeks ago for, for maybe specific kind of plays like you're talking about in terms of 
driving paths to the basket and defenders who are in the spot first or whatever, whatever terminology you want to use. I think what it is is a culmination of a year long's worth of work to get to be consistency. So I don't think, I think there's a, there's a Delta line that you're referencing as February 9th, uh, you know, that you referenced, there's a Delta line to what consistent work looks like, but it didn't start six weeks ago where we started saying, oh, we're going to be better at this. I think that that's an important line, line so, distinction. So you, to make. so you mentioned just how the game has changed and you know, when, when, when this, when the whole, is it too easy for offenses or is there too much scoring thing kind of crescendoed around Luca's 73 point game and maybe the all-star game too, which was a whole, I mean, it's a whole, it's an exhibition. It's not the same as a regular game. Um, I wrote something and I've repeated this on this podcast where I just think most of the explanation for why this is, is just that the league took a while to realize that three is greater than two, the league, I mean, teams, not the league office, how much greater three is than two. And once teams really figured that out and stocked their rosters with players who could shoot threes and, and now kids are shooting threes from a young age. So the roster stocking of those players is going to get bigger and bigger every year. And not only did they realize that, but more threes make sure twos easier because the paint is open. I just think it's more of a math problem than a quote unquote officiating or we're giving too much benefit of the doubt problem. I, if you slice up the pie, to me, the offensive explosion is more just teams being smart about how they hunt shots than anything else. Um, that said, um, there has been a lot of talk at the competition committee, and I'm sure you guys hear it privately too, about the pendulum did has maybe, in the opinion of some, swung too far rules wise with the rule. I mean, people have said it on the record, obviously the rules are too friendly to offenses. So I would ask Joe, um, as, as someone who's lived in the, in the game and played in a different era and also run teams in a different era as it shifted into this era, did you agree with that conception that maybe the pendulum had swung too far? And have you liked how the last, whatever line of demarcation money you want to say, but like how the last, six weeks of basketball has looked and felt compared to when it was really crescendoing in those high scoring games. I think, the, I think the pendulum may have swung too far, just like it may have swung too far for the defense back in the late nineties, early two thousands. And you wanted to open up the game a little bit more. So I, I don't um, deny that, you know, you look at the game and you try to keep your fingers on the pulse of the game. But even if you think the pendulum has swung to the offensive side, you don't walk into Monty's office and say, hey, Monty, the pendulum may have swung too far. You guys need to change how you call. You have conversations about what you think is a foul and what's not. Zach, if you had a, 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 a video, if you had a camera, maybe two months ago, three months ago, Monty and I were in my office. He was the offensive player. I was the defensive player. And we were walking through. Monty was driving hard. You know, he can't he, stop. He, he me, might, Jack. He, Let's be he clear. Might, he can't stop. Yeah. Well, he, he probably missed, committed you know. a flagrant, first of all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He he shot me in the elbow. But <laughs> we were we were literally in my office at he's driving, I'm sliding, Monty. If the offensive player pushes off, that's an offense. Well, and we went over a bunch of stuff like that. It's that kind of conversation that goes on in the office. Zach. It's not like this. It's not this conspiracy of like, hey, man, you know, we need to do this. I will say this too, Zach. Is that from the very, let's say at the beginning of this season, Zach, I'll say this. And Monty spoke to consistency. Early in the, I think it was the first week of the season, Monty was walking by my office. The door was open. I said, Monty, Monty, come see. He came in and I showed him a play with a guy that got a tech. And I said to Monty, I don't know about that tech. Let's make sure that if we're going to call a tech on a guy for this, that it's consistent across the board yeah. that we call that tech on every, Monty, you remember that? 
I do. Yep. Absolutely. So, Zach, what, what, this is what, what, what was the what what was the nature of the tech? Sorry to interject, but I think people would want to know. Like, was it a arguing with refs tech? Was it a hanging no, on the rim it tech? A, it might have been a, a, a slight it was, it was wave. A respect for the game, technical. Yeah, it was like a slight wave. Like, like yep. and, and I was saying the money. Okay, if we're gonna call that, then you got to call it against everybody to be consistent. But my point, the bigger point, Zach, is that's what really happens in here. It's me and money up guarding each other. It's me talking, hey, Monty, take, take a look at this. It's Monty coming in my office. Joe, what do you think of this right here? And so it's a collaborative effort, but I can assure you it's not some conspiracy of here's what we need to do. It's really trying to get the game to look the right way. You don't want the game to look the wrong way. And that means great offensive plays and players Great defensive. Some of the all-time best plays in this league are defensive plays. The LeBron block, Tayshawn Prince running down Reggie Miller blocking. Like, just, it, there are some incredible, and we don't want to take that out of the game either. So I think it's just, it really is, Zach, a balance of all of this, making sure that the game doesn't swing too far one way or the other. But I now, do think it's important, Zach, to note that what Joe's saying is, is that this is us doing the work that we're, you know, that we've been hired to do, which is three months ago, we're having these discussion again about our current rule book, making sure that we're consistently giving the right interpretation to the rules that are already on the books. And when we see things not living up to that consistency, it's both of our responsibilities to make sure we're delivering to the franchises exactly what our rule book says they should expect from night to night. Now, to go back to the larger point of did the pendulum swing too far and how this has been brought up in competition committee and blah, blah, blah. I would always challenge people. Okay. If you, if you think and not challenge, like I disagree with them challenge, just like let's have the fun thought exercise. If you think the pendulum has swung too far, what concrete solutions can you offer me to change it? And you're not allowed to say, bring back hand checking. I ban them from saying that because I don't think anyone really wants a return to how that looked. And so then you start to hear people really sort of, well, you know, they got to make it more friendly for the defense. I say, okay, how do you make it more friendly for the defense? Part of it, when people really drilled down on it, is the kind of, not bang, bang, but who's in the spot first? Who initiates the contact? Did the offensive players just jump into a defense player who was already there? Who gets that call? You could zero in on it that way. A another area that I hear a lot, and I'd be interested in Monty and your take on this. And I heard this from a GM just last week at, in, a, in a meeting. Um, landing spot stuff. Has the landing spot legislation gotten too friendly? Not friendly, but ha has has that benefited offensive players too much? And it's not just the three free throws it's I, I hear from from coaches and GMs our guys are like afraid to contest shots now so they contest from the side or they don't contest at all I, is there any wiggle room there is that an area of study well I think we we heard that from a GM as well maybe on the competition committee and so uh, I think that one of the things that we have to remember is as the game has changed Closeouts are much different than they were, again, to use Joe as an example. Everything below the free throw line meant you were already up on your, your opponent. To You didn't have to close out. You were right there for the most part. And so you didn't get these wild contests. And what we saw several years ago, which what instigated this to coming in, quite frankly, Zach, is the play in the Western Conference Finals in which Kawhi Leonard was injured on the play. And as such, you're going to have a situation where when the game is played in space and you have these distanced closeouts, these distance contests from defenders, you've got to be really careful. One of the fundamental tenets of all refereeing at all levels anywhere is a safe environment for the players to actually play the game that they've spent so much time learning and growing into professional at our level, the professional skill set. And we got to make sure that the competition is not one in which dangerous plays are possible. I think that the closeout rules are correct right now. The inverse could also be argued that if they are allowed to, to take the landing space away and we have more ankles turned, then the offensive player doesn't feel safe in which they can con compete. And so, you know, that that can swing or cut both ways. 
I do think that it is important that players should be able to expect when they're not doing a non-basketball move, which we did to address a lot of this, and we have addressed an enormous amount of what you're talking about. I was I was about to give yeah. you credit for, for that and will once you're done. Yeah, and I think that that's the right balance is taking away the non-basketball move where people are not abnormally launching themselves to a closeout defender, but we still have to allow them a normal shooting motion and the safety of coming back down to a normal playing position in which they can comfortably understand they're not going to get hurt every time they go up to take a jump shot. I, I don't do this to, to puff the league up or anything. I, I just, I just, I do it because I don't think a lot of the discussion of this subject um, includes this and some of the plays that benefited the offense that you have more or less taken away are picking out your legs, you know, or, or jumping into jumping sideways into people. Those are much more commonly offensive fouls. Now the Chris Paul, I call it the Chris Paul trick. You may as ascribe it to somebody else where you're bringing the ball up the court and someone's behind you and you just stop or turn sideways and stick your butt out. And that that's now an offensive foul. The rip through move is now a non shooting foul every single time. If, if, if and when, it's even called. So those things have, have been taken away. I'm going to, can I, now there are a couple um, uh, more dramatic ideas that people like to pitch or one that people like to pitch and one that I have thought about in my dumb brain. Can I run those by either one of you? Yeah. I'll let Joe jump in on this. Joe, Joe, for Joe, one you hear a lot and I don't study the price of courtside seats and I'm not a geography major. So I haven't like done the spatial calculations but what is the league's reaction when smart basketball people who work for teams say, how about we just eliminate the corner three? I've heard that before, but anytime you hear something like that, like, like, like you hear a lot of, uh, Zach, you know this, man. It's a lot of, you hear a lot of stuff, man. Like a lot of incoming stuff you hear. And I've heard that about the corner three. And my question when I've heard it is, okay, what does that look like? What 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 does it do for the game? What does it look like? And has somebody tried it? Has some other league tried it? Like you you, know, you hear that stuff, and the first thing you're gonna do internally here is you're gonna ask all of those questions right there right away. What's it look like? You know why are we doing it? How is it gonna benefit the game? Like you 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 go through a list of questions that you start asking when there's any type of proposal, and so until you can answer those questions, it's it's just something that's being proposed out there. But if someone is going to suggest that, uh, seriously, internally here, we would have to go through all of that. But that's that's not been on anybody's radar here internally, Zach. I, I can tell you that. Can can I pivot to something else real quick, Zach? Because I don't want to sure, forget. Sure, but I, I have one more. I have one more crazy idea for you. But uh, you can pivot, and I can pivot back. Well, no, let me get your second crazy idea, and then. I'll okay. it to what I'm well, I don't say. think it's crazy, but I just in thinking of in, in challenging myself to just like, OK, come up with actual ideas to help the defense. If you think that that's necessary and I'm not saying that it is, but if you think it is brain, think of something that's like actually reasonable. That's not hand checking. And I thought, you know, is there a middle ground somewhere between our current defensive three second rule? And the FIBA rule where you just can plant your biggest guy in the paint forever and ever. And I don't think anybody wants that. And I and I started well, like, what if it were like D4 or D5? And so, because you see offensive players, they time it, right? So like, I'm waiting to drive. One, two, you got to clear. Now I'm going. If that's an extra beat, extra two beats, does that matter? Does it screw up the game too much by eliminating those drives and highlight plays that we want to see? Is there, maybe this is for Monty too, is, is there... Is that is how crazy is that idea? Basically, well, I, I'll jump in real quick, Joe, just in the sense that I get criticized for not being able to count to three. Now you want me to have to count to four. And <laughs> well, I this is but this is the claim that when I bounce this off teams, teams will say, well, they don't really call defensive three seconds anyway. Well, we I disagree with that. But teasing aside, I I'll, let Joe, I'll let I'll let Joe answer. I do think it would have an impact on some of our best plays. In I do, too. That plays at the rim are some of the best plays to referee. I can speak from personal experience. Joe, I'll let you speak to the player's perspective. But play at the rim is, man, it, it's what makes our game beautiful. And it, it's what makes our game different. I, I I don't think there's another league that, that doesn't play, that doesn't allow you to play zone. And that's why you see the most incredible plays in the world. I, I 
laugh with people all the time. I tell them, you can think that you have a clear lane to the to the rim. You can think that you have a clear lane to that rim and you see the space and you go and you dribbling that and you think, oh my God, the, 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 the lane is open. That lane, these, the, 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 these players in this league are so good, man. And as Monty said, man, the, the incredible plays at the rim, you, you know, look, Steph changed the game with his shooting, but most of the incredible plays are at that rim in this league. And I don't think you want to take that away. Um, so that, that, that's the only thing I would say about that is that, that you don't want to take that away. That, 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 that's, what's made this league is, is people show up and they see things that they've never seen before. Okay. While I have you here, I want to switch topics for just two minutes, five minutes, whatever it is. Um, cause I think this is a very important topic and I think it's going to become a major, major discussion point over the next three weeks as the season ends and awards thinking and season kicks in. Um, what do you think of the 65 game limit for all three NBA teams, the all defense teams, MVP, most improved six man defensive player of the year, every, basically everything, but the all rookie teams, I think and rookie of the year, um, we're going to see a bunch of players fall just short, including guys who may have had good candidacies for a third team, all NBA, like Donovan Mitchell, Jimmy Butler. There are some other cases for even like most improved Jalen Johnson is going to be very close. He's got to play, I think every game going forward. Um, uh, we've seen Tyrese Halliburton kind of play through a minutes restriction to the result of which was that he remains eligible for all NBA and has not missed the, the requisite 18 games or whatever it is. Is this working as intended? Um, well, I'll just start there. Is this working as intended? Yes, it's working as intended because guys are on the floor a lot more. We have the internal data here uh, that players are playing more games now. The second thing I would say is, you know, ask yourself, why did we feel like we had to put a 65 game rule in? Like, like we forget about that portion of it, that it had gotten to the point where we just weren't seeing the star players on the floor anymore. And so between the player participation policy and the 65 game rule, we felt that we had to address this issue. About the 65 game rule too, Zach, and I wanna address that head on with you. This was collectively bargained with the Players Association to say, yes, we agree that we should have. Now, the number, you can debate the number what it could have been, I, it was a big debate on that. But then when it came to 65, it was, yes, that's a good number. That's 20% of the season that the guys can miss and still be eligible for all of these awards. These are our most important, most important awards that we have. And we're saying, if you play 80% of the season, you're still eligible. And so whatever number it would have landed at, Zach, I'm sure it would have affected someone. You said... You, you you said the word you used was it's, it's going to affect a bunch of players. I don't know if it's going to affect a bunch of players. I think it's going to, I think it's going to affect some. And I agree with you on that. And you feel bad for those guys if 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 it happens if it plays out that way. But you you are going to select some number. It was going to impact some people. But your first question was: Is the rule working? Absolutely. Because all the data, guys are playing more now than we've seen in, in a while of just being on the court night in and night out. Was there, there are a couple sort of ripple effects of this beyond just players participating more or, or that are connected to that. Number one, was there worry about a player playing hurt just to get the all NBA count up to the point if, if there's money at stake for this player like there is for Tyrese Halliburton for instance is there any anxiety about that and is there direct dialogue in cases like that between the league office a team like the Pacers and whoever you know represents Tyrese Halliburton just to make sure everyone understands the rule correctly what's at stake here is this safe in that specific case was there any dialogue so Zach uh, we, we're not having dialogue about that right now. I, let, let me answer that first and foremost. We're not having dialogue about specifically what you're talking about right there. 
my conversations with teams and players before the season started, when, when I was talking to them about this 65 games and player participation, participation policy, I was very adamant to guys, hey, guys, this is not the league trying to force you to play hurt. This is not, this is not us trying to, I, I, Zach, I was with everybody. I was with these teams now and all the teams I talked to, I said, look, dude, if you're hurting, you can't go out there and play. Trust me. I know you, you, you can't go out there. If you're injured, if you're sore, you're banged up. You, yeah, guys, guys can play through that, but if you're injured, you can't go out there. And so I wanted to be very clear that we're not trying to force you to play hurt. And if that means that you are below the 65 games, then, it, then you're below the 65 games. If you're injured, Zach, you can't play anyway. You can't play out there when you're injured. Like, when you're injured and can't go, you can't go. And I was very clear to, to guys, guys, don't go out there and try to play if you're hurt. If you're injured and hurt, don't, don't try to go out there and play. Don't do that. And I wanted them to hear that from me, from the league office. Well, I'm... It there's $40 million telling a guy like Tyrese Halliburton, maybe a, a conflicting message, but I understand like every case is going to be different. And maybe the intent of the rule, I think the league would argue is probably like, there are going to be some sort of tough it out instances. And like, that's kind of part of the deal. I bring up Halliburton and I bring up, I, this is one of my pit issues. Uh, I bring up third team, all NBA a lot and whether 65 games, makes sense for all three all NBA teams. And I bring that up because third team all NBA for me as a voter has always been the place where it, it, it often comes down to like, on the one hand, this guy that we, that we all know is like one of the best guys, but played 58 games. Kevin mm -hmm. Durant has been this guy in the past LeBron. We all know this guy's like one of the best guy. And there's other guy who's played 75 games. It's like really good but we all kind of know that like, he's not as good as this other guy. And mm -hmm. because of the way the bonuses and the super max works that vote, if you vote for the 75 games played guy may mm -hmm. make a, that person eligible for a super max that like, if we were all having a beer, we'd be like, that guy's like not a super max player. This other guy we all know is that, is that it? Is that sort of unintended consequence, something that's been talked about? So you you whenever you put these rules in, so so let's let's take your premise there, Zach, that there was fifty eight games, and one of those guys you said ran or someone played fifty six games, played fifty six games. We'd be sitting here having the same conversations, like uh, so. So it's so that's my, that's why I'm saying I'm saying I don't want any games played for third team All NBA just just for this specific reason. That's one of my oh, just, just pretend eliminate... that's one of my pet pet because oh, okay, every so... voter is going to say there's a threshold. If like you're if you don't even get fifty, you're just not going to be considered anyway. So you, I get your point that there's always going to be a line, whether it's a bright line written in legislation or an informal line that we all understand. There's always going to be a line somewhere. Yeah, I, I, that, and that's my only point is that is that when you put these rules in, that rarely can you look at a rule that you put in and go, "This is going to be perfect for everyone." No one is going to be unhappy with this rule. It just—I mean—the reality of life doesn't work that way. I had a G, not a GM, a head coach, three minutes into this podcast, text me while you and Monty were arguing about something you and money were going I, I had a g a, a head coach text me while we <laughs> three minutes into this he sent me a video <laughs> money knows who it is already he sent me a video and said it's not even his team it's two other teams playing and he sent the video and said joe d this is an obvious travel man we we can't miss this call this is what <laughs> This is what I bet happens. I could get. The, I bet I could get the coach within three coaches. I'm not going to play the guessing game with you, but I bet I'm giving my over under at two and a half before I get the coach. I, when we get off of this podcast, I want to hear your three coaches <laughs> to say yes. I might or no. get it in one. <laughs> you might get it in one, but but he he hit me three minutes into this podcast. So anyway, I'll just let you know that. All right, look, you guys are giving me too much of your time. Joe Dumars, wanting me cut you. I just. It's nice to have you come on and answer some questions because yeah. I just thought there's just been so much 
speculation. Let's actually sort of talk about it. And I think we talked about it and some questions were answered and you guys are very busy. You probably have to go, I guess, go, go back to your office one-on-one -on -one game, you know, to try, just try and keep it safe. Yo, when I got to answer this call. I mean, I got to answer this text right here. Yeah. You got to answer this text. All right. Thank you guys. And I will see you at an arena uh, soon. I hope so. Okay.